Aikil Agile Force on this area in Pumal, Kerala in Karnataka. Five killed as gale force winds, rain pummel Kerala, Karnataka AA. Very severe cyclone Tokti expected to cross Gujarat coast this evening. Special correspondent to Rowan Interparim slash Mingaluru, Pane. Gale force winds, heavy rain and high tidal waves swept the coastal belt of Kerala, Karnataka and Goa as cyclone Tokti hurtled northwards towards Gujarat on Sunday, leaving at least five persons dead damaging hundreds of houses, uprooting electricity poles and trees and forcing large-scale evacuation. According to the India Meteorological Department, IMD, Tokti, which has intensified into a very severe cyclonic storm, is likely to intensify further during the next 24 hours and reach the Gujarat coast on Monday evening. High wave warnings with flooding of low-lying areas and damage to property have been issued for Kerala, Karnataka AA, Goa, Maharashtra, Gujarat, Lakshadweep, and South Tamil Nadu. A joint bulletin issued by the Indian National Centre for Ocean Information Services, INCOIS, in Hyderabad and IMD forecast damage over Porbandar, Amreli Junaga, Gir Somnath, Bhutat, and Bhawanagar, plus the coastal areas of Ahmedabad. An estimated 1.5 lakh people are being shifted from low-lying coastal areas in Gujarat while 54 teams of the National Disaster Response Force, NDRF, and the State Disaster Response Force, STRF, have been deployed in the state. Maharashtra, too, is bracing for the cyclone as the Met Department predicted heavy to very heavy rain at isolated places in North Konkan, Mumbai, Thane, and Palgha and extremely heavy rainfall in Raya on Monday. Four deaths were reported from Karnataka, Uttarakhanda, Udupi, Chikkamagluru and Shawemoga districts. Roads in coastal districts were washed away and about 12 kilometers of beachfront from Kulai to Sisahitlu in the Israel bombs home of Hamar's Gaza chief. 42 killed in worst daily death toll yet. Reuters Gaza slash Jerusalem. Israel bombed the home of Hamas chief Yahya al sawa in Gaza early on Sunday and sirens warning of rocket attacks sounded in Israeli border towns shortly after dawn as hostilities stretched into a seventh day with no sign of abating. At least 153 people have been killed in Gaza since Monday, including 42 on Sunday the highest daily death toll in a single day. Israel has reported 10 dead, including two children. The Security Council met on Sunday to discuss the worst outbreak of Israeli-Palestinian violence in years. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres reminded all sides that any indiscriminate targeting of civilian and media structures violates international law and must be avoided at all costs, said UN spokesman Stefan Ujarik in a statement on Saturday. Both Israel and Hamas, the Islamist group that runs the enclave, insisted they would continue their cross-border fire after Israel destroyed a 12-story building in Gaza City that housed the U.S.-associated press and the Qatar-based Al Jazeera media operations. The Israel military said the Al Jalar building was a legitimate military target, containing Hamas military offices. COVID-19 response over next 6 to 8 month critical of WHO scientist answer of or of more waves. I think this topic is COVID-19 response over next 6 to 18 months critical. Top WHO scientist warns of more waves from Yakin and Chennai. Predicting that the COVID-19 pandemic is likely to have subsequent waves as well. Dr. Somya Swaminathan, chief scientist at the World Health Organization, who has been maintaining a keen eye on the developments in India, says the efforts put in in the next 6 to 18 months will be most critical in battling the pandemic. A lot depends also on the evolution of the virus itself, the ability of vaccines to keep up with variants, and it also depends on the duration of protective immunity of vaccines. A lot of this is changing, she says. 
we know that there will be definitely an end to the acute phase of the pandemic, when we have vaccinated about 30% of the world's population, which is what we would like to see by the end of 2021. Then we can start seeing a significant reduction in the deaths. Then 2022 can be about ramping up vaccination. Making clarifications on treatment protocols, Dr. Somria said it was important for the people to understand that the wrong drug given at the wrong time could actually have more bad effects than good. Many of the drugs commonly being used now have not been shown to have any effect. Nations can customize the WHO protocols for their local contexts, she advises. Congress pledged arrestors by Delhi police. Six feet from your door step. Two prisoners arrested in oxygen racket case. Police arrested man over oxygen cylinder as scam. Man as tied to death by couple over rupee hundred. The darkness. Deepness. Lockdown extended till May 24 announced CM. Lockdown extended till May 24, announces CM. DDMA asks officials to ensure strict compliance with rules. Special Correspondent New Delhi The Delhi government on Sunday extended the ongoing lockdown that was in place till May 17 by another week till 5 a.m. on May 24. Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal said the lockdown that was first imposed on April 19 has brought about a reduction in the number of cases and a dip in the positivity rate as well. Positivity rate the number of COVID cases is decreasing in Delhi and recovery has increased but we do not want to lose this game, therefore, lockdown is extended. In the past 24 hours, Delhi has reported around 6,500 cases and the positivity rate has come down to 10% from 11%, Mr. Kejriwal said. Hoping that in the next week, there will be greater recovery, he said, as far as I can understand, Delhi is slowly coming back on track. The lockdown is to continue as it is, no concessions will be given. Last week, the government had announced the closure of the Delhi Metro as a part of a more stringent lockdown. The Delhi Disaster Management Authority, DDMA, in its order, told officials to ensure strict compliance with the lockdown rules and take action against those found to be violating the rules. The situation of COVID-19 in NCT of Delhi has again been reviewed and observed that positive cases, as well as positivity rate, is still high and the bed occupancy, oxygen-supported slash ICU beds, in the dedicated COVID-19 government and private hospitals slash nursing homes is also on the higher side. Curfew needs to be extended for another week in the territory on NCT of Delhi except for essential activities slash services. For overall well-being and safety of the people of NCT Delhi, the DDMA order read. It is less than 10,000 cases for third consecutive day. Police harassing volunteers for putting posters questioning PM. Recovery is higher than fresh COVID cases in Gurugram. Government deploys a staff to answer detress call.
and are recently looms over lockdowns migrants scramble to leave gv nagar Vaccine drive creates to health in Kashmir due to acute storage. Lockdown in Haryana extended till May 24. Lockdown in Haryana extended till May 24th. Positive cases high in the state, government. Special correspondent Guru Gram. The Haryana government on Sunday extended the lockdown in the state for another week till May 24th. This is the second extension after it was first imposed for a week on May 3rd. Stringent measures. Making the announcement, Haryana Home Minister Anil Vij, in a tweet, said, Mohamari alert slash Surkshit Haryana extended from 17 May to the 24th of May. Stringent measures will be taken to implement the alert. Now, after duly considering the fact that the number of COVID positive cases are still high in the state, in exercise of the powers conferred under Section 22.2H of the Disaster Management Act, 2005, the undersigned in my capacity as chairperson, State Executive Committee hereby extends the Muhammari Alert Surakshit Haryana. For another one week, i.e., from the 17th of May 2021, 5 a.m. onwards to the 24th of May 2021, till 5 a.m., in the state of Haryana along with the guidelines to be implemented, during this period, issued earlier, read the order by Chief Secretary Vijayward on Revised Guidelines The Haryana government had last week revised the guidelines for the lockdown to cap the number of people at weddings and funerals to 11. Wedding processions were also banned in the state. Weddings can now be conducted only inside homes or at courts. Punjab government extends curbside till end of May. Punjab government extends curbs till end of May. CM reviews COVID-19 situation in state. Press Trust of India, Chandigarh. Amid high positivity and fatality rates, the Punjab government on Sunday extended all existing COVID-19 restrictions till May 31st. The state government has imposed extensive curbs, in addition to measures like weekend lockdown and night curfew to check the spread of the infection. The announcement regarding the extension of curbs was made by Chief Minister Omarinder Singh, who gave directions for strict enforcement of all restrictions, asking the deputy commissioners to continue determine opening of shops in a staggered manner. They can also make suitable amendments based on local conditions as long as these do not dilute the state's overall restrictions, said Captain Imrinder in an official statement here. Reviewing the state's COVID-19 situation at a meeting, he said while the restrictions so far has shown results, with some decline in daily infection numbers, there is a need to extend the curbs due to high positivity rate of 13.1% as of May 15th and case fatality rate, CFR, standing at 2.4%. Strict implementation The chief minister said the district authorities will continue to ensure strict implementation of all directives of the Union Home Ministry or the state government on COVID-appropriate behavior, including social distancing norms, regulating crowds in marketplaces and public transport. Bride losses better with virus. Sarnath Temple closed in till June 15. Jagannath Temple closed till June 15. Press Trust of India Puri, Orisha. 
keeping in view the surge in COVID-19 cases in Orisha and also in Puri. The authorities of the Temple of Lord Jagannath in the Pilgrim Town on Sunday announced that the 12th century shrine would remain out of bounds for the public till June 15. The famous temple is closed for the devotees since May 5 as a statewide lockdown was imposed by the Orisha government. The Sri Jagannatha Temple Administration made the decision to keep the temple closed for people till June 15 at a review meeting chaired by SJTA Chief Administrator Dr. Krishan Kumar and attended by Puri Collector Samart Verma. Positive mothers should continue Tengaru care. Kerala village bids Edui to Somaya. Three estate did 25 positivity. Three states exceed 25% positivity. AP hits new peak of 24,171 cases, Kerala tests drop. Staff reporter Bengaluru. Karnataka's 31,531 new COVID-19 cases on Sunday represented a test positivity rate, TPR, of 27.84%. Of the new cases 8,344 cases were in Bengaluru urban district. The Department of Health said 1.13 lakh tests were carried out for the day. There were 403 more deaths. There are over 6 lakh active cases. Kerala's graph, after the highest spike on May 12 of 43,529 new cases, showed a drop. However, testing too was dipping. On Sunday, the state reported 29,704 new cases from 1,15,982 samples. The TPR showed a slight reduction at 25.61%. The state added 89 recent deaths to the official list. Active cases, on a steady rise till Saturday, showed a reduction, dropping from 4,45,334 to 4,40,652. However, there was no let-up in hospital admissions, and 3,640 more persons were admitted, while total hospitalized cases stood at 37,117. ICU admissions were rising. A total of 3,686 patients were in ICUs, and 64 were newly admitted. Irnakulim continued to have the maximum active cases at 68,352 while Tiro and Interparim had 45,093. Andhra Pradesh hit a fresh peak with 24,171 new cases on Sunday, and added 101 deaths. Active cases rose to 2,10,436. The daily TP had been rising even after the 18-hour curfew from May 5. The 94,550 samples tested in a day returned a TP of 25.56%. In spite of a lower number of tests in Telangana, 3,816 new cases and 27 deaths were reported on Sunday. Daily screening was lower by nearly 20,000 tests. The number of active cases in Tamil Nadu rose to 2,19,342 with another 33,181 persons testing positive on Sunday. A total of 311 persons died taking the toll to 17,670. With inputs from Taro and Interparam, Vijayawara, Hyderabad and Chennai bureaus. YASR Congress MP moves a AC for bail in Sedasan case. The road from Ladakh is fueled up with disruption. China and India ties are moving into a zone of problems even as Delhi grapes falls with pandemic related issues.
the road from Ladakh is paved with disruptions. China and India ties are moving into a zone of problems even as New Delhi grapples with pandemic-related issues. It has been a year since the news of tensions between Indian and Chinese troops on the line of actual control, LAC, in Ladakh first broke. Dismissed as a routine event in the first few weeks by officials, the truth about the extent of Chinese ingress could no longer be hidden when India lost 20 soldiers in a violent clash with soldiers of the People's Liberation Army, PLA, in mid-June. As has been evident from commercial satellite imagery, sparse official statements and a few interviews, the crisis eventually involved seven places, Depsang Plains, Gilwan, Gogra, Hot Springs, North Bank of Pangongtso, Kailash Range and Daimchok. Border Crisis The situation at Gilwan was resolved a few weeks after the deadly clash, and the two sides disengaged from the face-off site. The Indian Army had occupied certain heights on the Kailash Range in end August, where it was in an eyeball-to-eyeball confrontation with the Chinese. In February this year, the two sides agreed to disengage from this location and from the north bank of Pangongtso. This was announced by India's Defence Minister in Parliament, where he also said that the two armies will convene the next meeting of the senior commanders within 48 hours after the complete disengagement in the Pangong Lake area to address and resolve all other remaining issues. The last such meeting of commanders was held on April 9, but the Chinese have refused to even discuss the remaining issues. Such an outcome was not entirely unexpected. It was written in this newspaper, looking after the Ladakh walk back, February 17, 2021, https colon slash slash bitly slash 3bslv that India had lost its only leverage on the Kailash range for the sake of disengagement on the North Bank. This happened after India reversed its position of simultaneously resolving all the flashpoints in Ladakh rather than deal with them piecemeal. India's military rationale was evident, with soldiers and tanks of the two armies barely a few meters apart, the situation was explosive and could escalate into a major crisis with a minor incident or accident. It was also clear that by restricting itself to its own side of the lack on the Kailash range, India had not taken control of the more dominating peaks like the blacktop and had a weak hand to play with. Politically, the Narendra Modi government seemed keen to announce a closure of the border crisis by creating the impression of an honorable solution against a major power. Three months later, no such closure is in sight. With the PLA troops denying India access to territories it controlled by patrolling, the government's avowed aim of restoring the status quo ante as of April 2020 remains unfulfilled. Even on the north bank of Pangong, a new status quo has been created where the patrolling rights are yet to be restored. Similarly, the Kailash range has seen neither the escalation nor the induction so far. In each statement, both India and China reiterate the need to ensure peace and tranquility in border areas. Even if there have been no further deaths after June and no firing after early September, the peace on the border is both unstable and unsustainable. Ongoing tensions, with massive deployments on each side, belie any hope of tranquility. That the security establishment in New Delhi is cognizant of the volatility and risk can be gauged from the fact that the Indian Army has undertaken a major reorientation of its units and formations towards the China border. COVID-19 and Geopolitics Even as the situation on the border poses a tricky challenge for India, its geopolitical concerns have been exacerbated by the devastation caused by the mismanagement of COVID-19. Through its vaccine metri program, New Delhi was presenting itself as a better alternative to Beijing's vaccine diplomacy, particularly in South Asia. Shaken by scenes of massive suffering and public criticism, the Modi government has backtracked on existing contractual commitments to supply vaccines to its friendly neighbors. Countries such as Bangladesh and Sri Lanka have started procuring vaccines from China, further casting doubts on India's reliability as a partner and raising questions about its ability to act as a counter to China. Sensing the opportunity, Beijing also moved in quickly, organizing a meeting with all South Asian countries except India, ostensibly to deal with the pandemic.
New Delhi was also the linchpin of the Quad's pledge to deliver a billion doses of COVID-19 vaccine throughout the Indo-Pacific by the end of 2022, an effort focused on countering Chinese influence in the region. With India now trying to import vaccines for its own population and reneging on its commitments to other poor countries under Gavi's COVAX scheme, the proposal now seems to be on a weak footing. The abysmal failure of the Modi government to anticipate and deal with a public health crisis has diminished India's aura as an emergent power. A Prime Minister Tom Toming the mantra of Atmanir Bharata or self-reliance has been forced to reverse a 16-year-old policy to accept global aid has laid bare India's vulnerabilities, further reducing its standing as the Quad's anchor. A weaker India is not only less attractive as a partner globally, it makes New Delhi more dependent on the United States to deal with China. That India has been acting at the behest of the US has been one of China's presumptions and this would only confirm Beijing's worst fears. It would further strain India-China ties, directly linking them to the vagaries of the China-US relationship. The hypothesis that India can safeguard its land borders by strengthening its oceanic prowess could then be put to test, a scenario New Delhi wants to avoid at all costs. Meanwhile, the threat of a two-front collusive threat after the Ladakh crisis forced the Modi government to seek peace with Pakistan. The back-channel talks, facilitated by the United Arab Emirates, led to the announcement of the ceasefire on the line of control which has held so far. But there have been contradictory voices emerging from Islamabad and the process seems to be floundering, as Pakistan awaits the steps on Kashmir promised by the Modi government. No political environment has been created in India for any such step so far. New Delhi's preoccupation with the pandemic may broke a delay of few weeks but fears of failure, a routine happening in India-Pakistan engagements, loom large. It is hard to predict the Pakistani course of action hence, but if the past is an experience to go by, it has usually been spiteful, reckless and dangerous, especially when India is seen as weak. Coupled with the imminent American military withdrawal from Afghanistan and a win for the Taliban, the signs are ominous. An assertive China and a vengeful Pakistan acting in concert on the land borders is India's military nightmare, which New Delhi will have to avoid at all costs. Chinese Supplies Meanwhile, Beijing has made certain significant moves towards New Delhi in the recent days. China's President Xi Jinping sent a message to Mr. Modi to convey sympathy and express condolences over the pandemic, which was the first communication between the two since the border crisis began last year. The Chinese foreign minister spoke to his Indian counterpart twice and offered help to deal with the pandemic, which led to an early clearance and approval of cargo flights from China. The Chinese ambassador to India has been highlighting the supplies and the material being sent to India. Beijing's efforts have been largely confined to private companies and donations from the Red Cross and Red Crescent societies, unlike other countries which have pledged government help to India. Curiously, much of the Chinese media ambiguously frames it as Chinese aid, while India explicitly avoids that framing and lays stress on the point that these are largely commercial contracts between private companies. Even if the Chinese intent is to project itself on a par with other global powers providing relief and aid to India, the fact remains that India is heavily dependent on China for crucial medical supplies. State-owned Sichuan Airlines had suspended cargo flights to India for 15 days beginning last month, but the supply chains have since been kept open by Beijing. This is in tune with the Indian demand from Beijing that the supply chain should remain open but the other demand to ensure stable product prices has not been met. More Point Scoring If the recent weeks during the pandemic provided an opportunity for the two Asian giants to work together, that hope has been lost as both governments have focused on point scoring. That reflects the broader state of bilateral ties but is also a fundamental difference emanating from the ongoing border crisis. As the talks between India and China have floundered, New Delhi has taken a position that the border issue is central to the bilateral relationship. This runs contrary to Beijing's argument that the boundary question cannot be seen as the whole of the bilateral relationship. In an ideal world, New Delhi can hope for a settlement that delineates and demarcates the lack in some form but Beijing has ruled out any such proposal. 
with soldiers of both armies facing each other in Ladakh and a lack of trust between the two countries as the two governments talk past each other in a period of geopolitical churn, it is clear that the China-India bilateral relationship is moving into a zone of increasing disruptions, and attendant risks of conflagration on the disputed border. Sushant Singh is a senior fellow with the Center for Policy Research, New Delhi. It is getting from bad to worse for women workers. In the pandemic, women have borne a disproportionate burden of the severe disruptions to life and the economy. The COVID-19 pandemic has destroyed millions of livelihoods and led to a sudden and large increase in poverty and a massive disruption of the labor market in India. Women workers, in particular, have borne a disproportionate burden. As the country meets the challenge of the second wave of the pandemic, it is crucial to learn lessons from the first wave to chart the policy path ahead. A widening gap. Even prior to 2020, the gender employment gap was large. Only 18% of working age women were employed as compared to 75% of men. Reasons include a lack of good jobs, restrictive social norms, and the burden of household work. Our recently released report, State of Working India 2021, One Year of COVID-19, https colon slash slash bitly slash 2rmw29p, shows that the pandemic has worsened the situation. The nationwide lockdown hit women much harder than men. Data from the Center for Monitoring Indian Economy Private Limited show that 61% of male workers were unaffected during the lockdown while only 19% of women experienced this kind of security. Even by the end of the year, 47% of employed women who had lost jobs during the lockdown, had not returned to work. The equivalent number for men was only 7%. Men who did lose work were able to regain it, even if it was at the cost of increased precarity or lower earnings, because they had the option of moving into fallback employment arrangements. Thus, 33% of formal salaried men moved into self-employment and 9% into daily wage work between late 2019 and late 2020. In contrast, women had far fewer options, only 4% and 3% of formal salaried women moved into self-employment and daily wage work, respectively. Nearly half of the women workers, irrespective of whether they were salaried, casual, or self-employed, withdrew from the workforce as compared to only 11% of men. Even as new entrants to the workforce, women workers had poorer options compared to men. Women were more likely to enter as daily wage workers while men found avenues for self-employment. Daily wage work is typically far less remunerative than self-employment as on average, between September to October 2020, a daily wage worker earned about 7,965 rupees compared to a self-employed worker who earned nearly twice that at 12,955 rupees. So, not only did women enter into more precarious work, it was also likely to be at very low earnings compared to men. Women tended to lose work disproportionately irrespective of the industry in which they were employed. For instance, the share of women in job losses in education was three times their share in that industry. So, while around 20 out of 100 workers in education were women, amongst those who lost work, about 70 out of 100 were women. Similarly, in the health sector, 40 out of 100 workers were women, while of the 100 in this sector who lost work, 80 were women. Growing domestic work with schools closed and almost everyone limited to the confines of their homes, household responsibilities increased for women. Married women and women from larger households were less likely to return to work, suggesting that the burden of care may be a reason for poor employment recovery. But even for those women who managed to remain employed, this came alongside a massive increase in the burden of household work. The India Working Survey 2020 found that among employed men, the number of hours spent on paid work remained more or less unchanged after the pandemic. But for women, the number of hours spent in domestic work increased manifold. In February to March, about 10% to 20% of women reported spending between 2 to 4 hours on domestic work. 
this share had increased to about 50% by September. This increase in hours came without any accompanying relief in the hours spent on paid work. The course to take The long-standing question of women's participation in India's economy has become more urgent with the pandemic disproportionately impacting women's paid work and increasing the burden of unpaid care work. The following measures are needed now. Expansion of the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, MREGA, and the introduction of an urban employment guarantee targeted to women as soon as the most severe forms of mobility restrictions are lifted. We further propose coordinated efforts by states to facilitate employment of women while also addressing immediate needs through the setting up of community kitchens, prioritizing the opening of schools and anganwari centers, and engagement with self-help groups for the production of personal protective equipment kits. Further, a COVID-19 hardship allowance of at least 5,000 rupees per month for six months should be announced for 2.5 million accredited social health activists and Anganwari workers, most of whom are women. But this is not enough. The national employment policy, currently in the works, should systematically address the constraints around the participation of the women's workforce, both with respect to the availability of work and household responsibilities. The pandemic has shown the necessity of adequate public investment in social infrastructure. The time is right to imagine a bold universal basic services program that not only fills existing vacancies in the social sector but also expands public investments in health, education, child and elderly care, and so on, to be prepared for future shocks. This can help bring women into the workforce not only by directly creating employment for them but also by alleviating some of their domestic work burdens, while also overcoming nutritional and educational deficits that we are likely to be confronted with as we emerge from this crisis. Rosa Abraham is Senior Research Fellow, Center for Sustainable Employment, Azim Premji University. Amit Pasole is Associate Professor of Economics. Azim Premji University. COVID updated for Covishield dose. Appointments already booked for the second dose remain valid, says government. Special correspondent New Delhi. The COVID digital portal has been reconfigured to reflect the change in the dose interval for the Covishield vaccine. The center had on May 13 extended the gap between the first and second doses of the vaccine to 12 to 16 weeks. Appointments for the second dose of the vaccine have to be in alignment with the enhanced duration between the two doses. However, appointments already booked online for the second dose will remain valid. The COVID working group chaired by Dr. N.K. Arora had recommended extension of the gap between the first and second doses of Covishield vaccine to 12 to 16 weeks. This has been accepted by the Government of India on May 13 said a Union Health Ministry release, adding that this had been communicated to the states and the Union territories. The ministry clarified that the requisite changes had now been carried out in the COVID portal. As a result, further online or on-site appointments will not be possible if the period after the first dose date for a beneficiary is less than 84 days, the ministry said. Further. The beneficiaries are advised to reschedule their appointments for a later date beyond the 84th day from the date of first dose vaccination, said the release. 
The ministry noted that there had been reports in a section of the media suggesting that people who had pre-booked their appointment for the second dose of Covishield in less than 84 days on Covid were being turned away from vaccination centers. The center had reiterated to the states and the union territories that the online appointments booked for the second dose prior to the change of the interval should be honored and that field staff should be given necessary instructions in this regard. Such beneficiaries must not be turned away, the ministry said. UNSC calls for end to violence in Gaza. Its chief warns that crisis could plunge region into an uncontainable security and humanitarian crisis. Agents France press Gaza City. Israeli strikes killed at least 42 Palestinians in the Gaza Strip on Sunday, the worst daily death toll yet in the almost week-long clashes, as the UN Security Council met amid global alarm at the escalating conflict. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres pleaded for an immediate end to the deadly violence, warning that the fighting could plunge the region into an uncontainable security and humanitarian crisis. Fighting must stop. It must stop immediately, Mr. Guterres said as he opened a Security Council session delayed by Israel's ally the US, calling the violence over the past week utterly appalling. The heaviest fighting in years, sparked by unrest in Jerusalem saw the rivals again trade heavy fire, with the death toll rising to 192 in the crowded coastal enclave of Gaza since Monday and at 10 in Israel, according to authorities on either side. Israel told the UNSC that the violence was premeditated by Hamas, urging condemnation of the militants during the UNSC session. It was completely premeditated by Hamas in order to gain political power, said Israel's ambassador to the world body, Gilad Evda. Mr. Eva said that Hamas escalated tensions due to internal Palestinian political maneuvering after the Palestinian Authority President, Mohammed Abbas, delayed long-awaited elections. Israel said on Sunday morning its continuing wave of strikes had in the past 24 hours struck over 90 targets across Gaza, where the destruction of a building housing news media organization sparked an international outcry. In Gaza the death toll kept rising as emergency teams worked to pull out bodies from vast piles of smoking rubble and toppled buildings, as relatives wailed in horror and grief. Israel's army said that about 3,000 rockets had been fired from the coastal strip towards Israel, the highest ever, of which about 450 failed launches fell in the Gaza Strip. Israel's Iron Dome anti-missile system had intercepted over 1,000 rockets, the army said in almost a week during which Israeli residential buildings have been hit, with over 280 people suffering injuries. The intensity of the conflict is something we have not seen before, with non-stop airstrikes in densely populated Gaza and rockets reaching big cities in Israel, said the International Committee of the Red Cross. 
at least 58 children have lost their lives in Gaza, local health authorities said. More than 1,200 people have been wounded and entire buildings and city blocks reduced to rubble. फ्रेंड्स आज का हम लोग पेपर पढ़ने का आज हम समाप्त करते हैं बाकी सब मैं ये डिस्क्रिप्शन बॉक्स में ग्रुप का लिंक दे दूंगा जिसमें आपको ये पेपर मिल जाएगा और वहां से आप लोग पढ़ लीजिएगा जय हिंद